Here in Hawaii, we can all enjoy the beautiful beaches because they belong to the state, not private landowners. No one can own our shorelines. Same goes for new lands created by volcanic activity. They belong to the state, to us all, not nearby property owners. These are concepts we might take for granted today, but it wasn't always the case. They are two of the important rulings, laws of the land, that were handed down by the Hawaii State Supreme Court, led by a public school grad, Roosevelt High. A conversation with Chief Justice, retired William S. Richardson, next. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox of PBS Hawaii. Mahalo for joining me for another Long Story Short. Today we get to chat with William S. Richardson, who served as Hawaii State Supreme Court Chief Justice from 1966 to 1982. He also served as Lieutenant Governor under John A. Burns. He was a trustee of the old Bishop Estate, and he was chairman of the Hawaii Democratic Party when Democrats surged to legislative power in 1954. And he's the namesake of the state's only law school. Popularly known as CJ for Chief Justice, William Richardson was raised in a working class family in Kaimuki. When you say you grew up in Kaimuki, it's not the Kaimuki that people here think of, is it? No, it was a Kaimuki that, uh, for me, I had to walk through the lanes from Wailai Avenue, about three blocks, going toward Waikiki, through a lane to my house. And my, my father built the house himself. No uh, street lights no and street the sidewalks? No street lights, only, only a lane. We could only walk in a lane. A no, dirt lane? A dirt lane. No, we had no car yet. And you moved to Kaimuki, which was country, after living in the city, Palama. Yes. I don't know whether we had very much, but we went by streetcar, and much of the time we just caught the streetcar and carried whatever you, you owned on your back. And how far did the streetcar go? Well, at one time to 6th Avenue, another time to 12th Avenue, and then next time all the way down to Wildlife Country Club, Keala Olu. That was electric trolley, right? Yes, yes, with, with a hook up above. So it was the mass transit of yesteryear. Well, you could call it that. Yes, you could. And one of your classmates was someone who also became very well known in Hawaii and accomplished, Isabella Iona Abbott. Oh, yes. She, she lived about three blocks away from me. She was one of the brains of the school. <laughs> she was the uh, first... Native Hawaiian woman to get a PhD in science. Yeah, and from Stanford, was it? Oh, yes. She's, she's a bright girl. Oh, talking about brains of the school, were you one of them? Oh, no. You sure? Oh, yes, I'm sure of that. I, I just, I got along. And that was it. When you finished high school, you went on to college. Was that a big thing in your family? Yes, it was. Um, not many not many boys went on to, to college and I think some people felt it was uh, time for one to start working at 16 or 17 and, and college was just out of the ordinary. Why did you go? What was the impetus? I, I think my father felt that I better get up there and I, I think he had visions of my going to the university but uh, I didn't have that vision yet. Were you <laughs> ambitious? Not that I know of, but... Uh, but you went ahead and went through four years I, I, at UH. I went four years at UH and enjoyed it all the way through. Met a lot of uh, people who would later be your allies in politics and yes, good yes. friends in good a friends, long life. Uh, they helped me in everything I had done. Uh, so you went to UH and yes, you had more than most people of your time had a college degree, but that wasn't going to be the end of your higher education. Well, I thought it was, but uh, I, I had a job with, with the oil company, and I thought, well, this would be great. I, I like this kind of work. I, I think I'll do this the rest of my life. And then one of the professors up at school 
went to see my father and she said, now this boy better go on to, to law school. And I said, well, how, how can you do that, Dad? You can't afford it. Well, he said, you know, if you, if you really got to go, uh, I'll rent your room out and you go on to college, which he did. In those days, it was five days by steamship and another four days by train to get to the East Coast. When you were at the University of Cincinnati Law School, that was a different time racially. Um, you're Hawaiian Chinese, Caucasian. What did people make of you? Where did you fit in? Well, I suppose I feel, felt in all right, but when the war came on, uh, there was some stigma. If anybody uh, different from, from the Holly kids that were around, uh, he was different. And, uh, did people think you were Japanese at the I think wartime? Many, I think many did after the, uh, the war started because they just didn't know. Do you remember getting exposed to overt racism? Uh, yes, but it was never so bad that I, I'd feel afraid to be around. Uh, and I, most of them knew that I, I was of draft age anyway and that I wouldn't be around very long and draft would get me and that, that would be the end of that. And indeed, you went on to infantry training? Yes, I went, uh, those days was all Army. I started with the Army Air Corps and then I went to, to Fort Benning, Georgia, the infantry school for the Army. And from there on I went on to the West Coast and then to the New Guinea and then to the Philippines. I spent most of my time, Army time there in the Philippines. Did that experience change your life in any way? being in the war? I, I wouldn't say that it did. I, I, I just took everything as, as it went along. Uh, it was draftable. I'd either go in as a foot soldier or, a, or, or an officer and that was it. Is it true that when you went back uh, to normal life that you didn't have to take the bar exam right after the war? Well, that's, that's true because they had, when I came back, it was an LLB, which is a little different from the JD today. And, and uh, they said, well, we'll just send you your JD degree and that's it. And so no hours and days and weeks and months of studying for the bar. No, 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 didn't have to do that at all. And they, uh, I went into the reserves and they stuck me in, in the Judge Advocate General's Department and there I stayed until I retired from the Army, which wasn't very long. <laughs> Following the war, William Richardson began working as a lawyer and married his childhood sweetheart, Amy Ching. The two raised three children. In the mid-1950s, Richardson emerged as a leader on the island's political scene, working closely with those friends he got to know while attending the University of Hawaii at Manoa. You were one of the people that was uh, excited about statehood, that helped to make it happen, that uh, created recrafted government in the wake of statehood. Uh, and now we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of